Hey, this is Ian Westerman, head pro at EssentialTennis.com, where it's our mission to provide passionate instruction for passionate tennis players just like you. Welcome to this episode of Ask Ian. I'm going to be answering a, a kind of a tricky question today from a viewer. This is something that I've been meaning to address for quite some time. It's a very, very important topic, and it's going to take me a while to unpack this, so hope you're ready. We're going to be talking about whether or not being a better player means that you're automatically a better coach, or this is somebody that's better to take lessons from compared to somebody who maybe isn't as good of a player. And this is an, an attitude that's very, very rampant among tennis players that you want to seek out the person with the highest ranking or that played professional tennis or whatever it is. So this was brought up by a comment that was left on a video where myself and Ira were rallying back and forth. This person left a comment saying, Ian, I don't want to come across as disrespectful, which by the way, almost always means that I'm about to be disrespectful, but your strokes and your movement are lacking. This is a simple drill that 12 year olds in most clubs where I am from can perform. By the looks of it, you have a hard time redirecting and using your left hand while performing your forehand. Do you actively coach kids? All right, so this person, uh, without saying it directly, is questioning my ability to coach based on my ability to perform certain skills as I was demonstrating a drill. So, we're gonna talk about two main concepts. They're both very important. The first concept is how skills are actually learned. How do we actually become good at a certain skill? I'm gonna talk first about the four stages of learning. And this concept was pioneered by a psychologist in the 1970s, and he came up with four different distinct phases or stages of learning any kind of skill. Maybe you've heard me talk about this before. I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. Pay close attention because this is critical to understanding this. Phase number one is being unconsciously incompetent. That means that you have no knowledge about whatever the skill is, you don't have any understanding, and you also can't perform it. You have no ability to execute it. Phase number two is being consciously incompetent. So now maybe you've taken a lesson or you've watched a video, you got some advice, you have some knowledge, but you still don't have the ability to execute. You still can't perform the skill. Phase number three, now that you've practiced it a little bit and you have some knowledge, is being consciously competent. So now you have that information. You've also maybe gone out and practiced a little bit with a partner, with a ball machine and tennis uh, example. So now you have some ability to execute, but you're still having to be conscious in order to do it. You have to be paying attention and reminding yourself, okay, first I do this and then this and then this in order to actually do it correctly. And the fourth and final stage is being unconsciously competent. So now you don't even have to be aware or conscious anymore. You just do it. It's become second nature. It's become habit, and you just do the right thing without even having to think about it any longer. Now, Everybody moves through these four stages each time that they learn a new skill. There's no escaping it, and ten tennis as a whole doesn't go through these stages. Every individual skill of tennis has to go through these, these stages. So learning how to hit a forehand, learning how to hit a backhand, volley, serve, every little part of your game, your footwork, all has to move through these stages, starting from not knowing what you don't know, and not be able, being able to execute it all the way down to being able to execute it correctly without even thinking. So in short, the goal is to learn and then forget each individual skill that makes up being a good tennis player. And so there's thousands upon thousands of these little skills that layer one on top of the other on top of the next. And so you go from skill to skill to skill to skill, understanding, practicing, and then forgetting and then doing the next skill, so on and so forth. Now, after years and years of this process, those very early basic skills, let's say you've worked for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years to go from being a total novice to being a professional tennis player. Those original basic fundamentals that you've started learning back when you started are just a far, far distant memory. They're no longer, you, you don't remember at all learning those skills because the whole point was to forget them, forget them because they've become automatic. 
Okay, so this is the first principle, and this leads to what's known as the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge. And I found a great article, which I'll, I'll link to in the description down below on Forbes.com. Uh, the author of this article opened the article by saying, Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw famously wrote, he who can does, he who cannot teaches. Maybe you've heard that before. A little, a little bit derogatory, derogatory towards teachers. But it's, more, it's often more accurate to say, he who can, cannot teach. He who can do, I'm sorry, I left out do. He who can do, cannot teach. It's natural for novices to seek out experts for guidance. That's why many organizations adopt formal mentorship and training programs. Unfortunately though, experts frequently make lousy teachers. Experts are sometimes so steeped in expertise that they don't remember what it was like to be a newbie in terms of both how much they knew and how they felt back then. The memory gap leads to an empathy gap. So this author is saying, once you become a high level expert at something, you no longer have any memory of what it was like to be new at it. And so it's very difficult to relate to somebody as you're trying to show them what to do. This also, the, the uh, curse of knowledge leads to a process gap. What I mean by that is being able to effectively teach is in itself its own skill. That takes many, many different small skills make up the larger skill of being a good teacher and you have to learn those skills. Um, this brings me to another article that I'm gonna to link to down below on edutopia.com. This is a website that gives coaching and ideas to, to educators and teachers. They, they gave some suggestions on how to overcome the curse of knowledge and they included multi-sensory learning or teaching, which means orally explaining things, kinesthetically guiding people through the movements, visually showing people what it should look like, giving a demonstration, using emotion, in order to get points across, using narratives or stories, using analogies. So these are all tools in an educator or teacher or coach's toolbox that need to be learned. And you also have to, you have to learn on top of knowing how to empathize and relate to students, you have to know multiple ways of teaching all of those individual skills because different students learn in different ways. And you also have to have a full, broad, complete understanding of all of those individual skills and where your individual student fits in with those skills. So when I go and teach Sally how to hit a forehand, her progress with her forehand is in a totally different place among the different stages of hitting a forehand than maybe Bob or Susie over here who's in a different spot. And so a good teacher needs to be able to pick out where in the progression from being a beginner to an expert a student is and has to have a plan of attack for each of those different phases of being good at each of those different skills. So, being able to execute at a very high level doesn't come with any of this knowledge, doesn't come with any of these skills, and so you have to learn these things. Bottom line is you have to be a student of teaching to be a good teacher. You cannot rely on being a great executor and think that that means that you'll be a good teacher. Or as a student, you cannot go to somebody who just says, oh, I was top whatever in the world, you know, executor, that's great, but do they know how to show you what it's like to go from beginner to beginner plus, which is all, probably hundreds of individual skills in and of itself. So they're totally, totally different things. So to wrap this up, in response to this person who left that comment, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and put it out there. Yeah, I'm uh, on my best day, I'm a 5-0 player, which I'm happy with that. I spent a decade learning how to execute. I, I spent a decade being a student of how to play tennis from age 11 to age 21. Then my focus completely shifted to being the best teacher possible. So from age 21 to now, almost age 35, it's been my life learning how to teach as effectively as possible. So my ability to execute has been on the back burner for well over a decade now. It's no longer my passion. My passion is now teaching and learning how to most effectively bring a student through the process of becoming better themselves. Now, 
to be very, very clear, and I'm sure I'm gonna get some comments on this down below, people who didn't watch through all the way, I'm not at all saying that because you're a great player means that you're a bad coach. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that one does not lead to the other. In fact, if you're a great player and you haven't studied how to be a great coach, it's probably gonna get in the way of you being an effective coach. Now, if you're taking lessons from somebody who is a very, very high level executor, very high level performer, and they've also studied how to be a great teacher, you can be good at both, but one does not automatically mean the other. Just like being an, an incredibly good coach doesn't automatically mean that they were an incredibly good player. There's lots of examples of that. Tony uh, Nadal is one. Um, I'm blanking, uh, Balateri. Nick Balateri is another example. There's lots of examples of that, not only in tennis, but in other sports and disciplines as well. So I'm gonna bring it to a close uh, for right now. Don't fall for going after the person who has the highest ranking or has the most impressive playing resume. Can those experiences be beneficial and valuable? Absolutely, I'm not saying that they have no meaning. Just don't think that because that person was an incredible player means that they're gonna be able to show you how to do the same thing. They need to be students of how to teach as well or else communicating and guiding you through that process will not be second nature to them. All right, we'll close it there for now. Thank you for watching. If you'd like some coaching on how to hit the most accurate and also the most powerful serves you've ever hit before, we've got a link to, to some coaching in the description down below, along with those articles that I referenced. It'll only cost you a dollar, so check it out. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, uh, click like, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. I could. I skipped over a lot of different things. I, I, could, I could revisit this topic, but I uh, don't want this to turn into a half hour, 45 minute video. So thanks for watching. Tell me what you think down below. Can't wait to see what your thoughts are. I'll talk to you again in the next episode of Ask Ian. For hundreds of free digital tennis lessons, head over to EssentialTennis.com right now. More wins and more fun on the court is right around the corner. You'll even get a free gift just for stopping by. Simply click the link at the top of any page.